Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, nō te whanganui a tāra ahau, ko James Tipping ahau, nō te mana hiko ahau. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Morning everyone, in person and online, I'm James Tipping, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer um, and part of the Senior Leadership Team at Te Mana Hiko, the Electricity Authority. It's my pleasure to welcome you all this morning to our technical briefing on the proposed actions to correct the 2019 UTS. We released our proposed actions last week and we appreciate there's a lot of technical detail underpinning this proposal. So we wanted to provide access to our people to provide any clarifications uh, that you may require. Next slide, please. So we've set down two hours for this morning's session. After a quick bit of housekeeping, I'll give you a very brief recap on how we got to this point, uh, and then we'll get into the main event. So I'm joined up on stage by my colleagues Christy Smith on my left, who's a senior economist in our market design team, and Doug Watt, our Manager of Market Monitoring, both of whom have been deeply involved right the way through the UTS process. Um, I've also got a number of other colleagues in the room with me. So, quick bit of housekeeping, health and safety first for those in the room. Um, in the event of an emergency, you'll be warned by an electronic alarm. If this alarm's sounding on your floor, we must evacuate the hotel to the evacuation point across the road um, out in Gray Street. Don't use the elevators, as always. If there's an earthquake or a major incident, please remain calm and stay in the room. In that case, take shelter under the tables or chairs if necessary and listen for an announcement over the PA system. Um, bathrooms are out the door and to the left. Um, with regard to questions, so uh, we've, we've got time to ask questions um, through the session. Um, Christy will be doing the main, the main part of the technical briefing. He's got a few natural break points um, where we'll be asking for questions, so please wait until those break points and he'll invite questions. Um, when you're asking a question, we request please attendees in the room raise your hand and we can call on you. Those on Zoom, use your virtual hand. Um, once I've asked you for a question, then I'll repeat that back over the microphone and then I'll ask um, one of my colleagues to answer that question for you. Um, we've got two hours this morning, so if we run out of time to answer all the questions, um, you're very welcome to submit further questions through email. Um, and if you happen to get back to the office and wished you asked something, then please um, fire it through to the team. Um, we will aim to publish any further questions and answers that we either aren't able to answer um, in the session or will receive afterwards. All the slides from the session will be posted on our website um, straight after the session. Uh, we will be recording this session and posting the recording on our website within the next week, so please don't make any other recordings. You can rely on the one that we're making and please make sure your phones are turned off as always so as not to interrupt. Um, so yeah, I really, really want to be clear that we want to protect the time we've got for um, the material that Christie's presenting and the questions on Christie's material, so please make sure we focus questions on, on those. Um, as I say, any other questions relating to other content, happy to take offline. Um, uh, and I'll move on to the next slide. So very briefly, a quick recap on the UTS claim. So an undesirable trading situation is a situation that threatens or may threaten confidence in or the integrity of the wholesale market. And it's a situation that can't be resolved under any other part of the code. I wanted to stress that these are not new provisions by any stretch and in fact date back to at least 2003. So they've been around a long time, um, so participants are, are well aware of these provisions. Um, so the, we, we do receive claims from time to time in UTSs, but the claims are, are very rarely upheld. So um, this is only the second time since the authority has been in existence, since 2010, that we've actually upheld a claim. The other one was in 2011. So in December 19, we had extreme weather, an extreme weather event in unprecedented circumstances, so record level inflows into the South Island Lakes. Uh, we had outages planned for the HVDC and the Poakura gas field um, later on the next year. We had contact operating new automated spill gates for the first time in a flood event. Meridian was withholding generation in the Waitaki by pricing it high, and Genesis was operating a, as a price taker in the South Island. So all those things combined um, led to what we're terming the confluence of factors. So. 
as I said in the previous slide, for a UTS claim, we have to determine whether the situation threatens or may threaten confidence in or the integrity of the wholesale market. And our final decision, uh, deciding that this was a UTS, was published near the end of 2020. We decided that between 3rd and 27th of December, the market outcomes were significantly different because of these confluence of factors, which then led to reduced competition, excess spill and high prices despite what the underlying conditions were, and the scale and duration were of a significant magnitude. So that then leads us on to having made a final decision, uh, the actions to correct. So under the code, we must attempt to correct a UTS and restore the normal operation of the market. The option set available to us is pretty wide, so we can take any action we consider necessary to provide um, that it relate, provided that it relates to an aspect of the electricity industry that the authority could regulate under the code. Last week, we published our proposed actions to correct and we're proposing at this point to reset final electricity prices and this is a very similar action to the 2011 UTS. Submissions close for this um, on the 27th of April followed by three weeks of cross submissions and we're aiming for a decision in August 2021. And I want to stress that this is a proposal that's in the paper and we genuinely want to hear your feedback on it. We've put a number of questions through the paper um, so we also want to hear your feedback on everyone else's feedback, so that's the role of the cross submissions. So please do, do give us a submission that we can consider. Last slide before I hand over to Christy. Um, there are another of number of other work streams happening in parallel at the moment. So we opened a market review on the 11th of December 2019 into what was happening in the market at the time. That was prior to the UTS claim coming in. We have been undertaking a market review, but that work has paused while we're prioritising the UTS investigation, and that work will unpause um, once we have, uh, have finalised the actions to correct. We've got separate compliance investigations into alleged breaches of the high standard trading conduct. Uh, those investigations are near completion. And we're also in the process of consulting on changes to the high standard of trading conduct rules. So those consultations, the consultation closes on the 23rd of March. Um, we're aiming to, to clarify expected behaviours and that'll be introduced with a significant uplift in our monitoring activity as well. So that's very briefly on the context and how we got to, to where we got. It's now time to hand over to Christy. And just before I do, I want to remind you, please hold your questions till the natural break points and Christy will call for questions. Um, I'll signal to you when you're able to answer your question. There will be about four slots for asking questions as we go through the session. Christy. Uh, thanks, James. So just a, a little bit of background. I'm a, a senior economist at the Electricity Authority. Uh, I grew up in Wellington before I uh, joined the authority. I worked at the um, Reserve Bank and other central banks for about 20 years. Um, all right. So uh, am I st I'm still going to be in view if I... I'm sure we can move the camera for you. I stand. Yeah. I may sit back down at uh, some point. You're in view now. All right, so we're um, mainly going to run through uh, four different things uh, today. So I'll describe the UTS and part five of the code, but uh, I'll do that very briefly given that James has already introduced it. Um, and then I'll be looking to summarize the proposed actions to correct the UTS, uh, the, the particular design elements of that and the rationale for those choices. Uh, and then I'll summarise the outcomes that, um, that arise uh, in relation to the, the, um, the proposal and answer questions. Um, so as James mentioned, we have to attempt to correct. Um, we can pretty much uh, do anything uh, provided it relates to, um, uh, to aspects of the electricity industry that we can regulate. Um, the, uh, actions are primarily mediated by directing participants to, um, to do things. Um, and, but these directions need to be consistent with um, um, the, the, the Act and, and law generally, but they can be inconsistent with the code. Now we are um, also required to consult with the uh, system operator if, um, if we consider that the action may affect system security. Uh, we don't think that that's actually um, uh, a situation that um, exists at the current um, 
um, uh, UGS disc, um, that we're uh, attempting to correct. But um, we have had discussions with uh, the system operator and with um, other uh, uh, relevant parties. And uh, we also have to consult. Um, and the consultation paper is really uh, aimed at uh, addressing um, that obligation. So with our actions, we're really trying to achieve two objectives. That's to uh, correct the UTS and restore normal operation as quickly as possible. Um, they are focused on correcting the 2019 um, uh, UTS, so they're, they're the UTS provisions aren't a kind of a, a backdoor replacement of code. Um, so if there are kind of long-standing issues or more fundamental design issues associated with market, then that's more um, properly the, the purview of the, uh, the, the, the code. We don't have a, a, a time machine, um, which is very unfortunate. Um, so the, the actions to correct are, are necessarily approximate. We can't um, replicate all um, all of the market processes that um, that would that um, would ordinarily be used if if uh, uh, if we were um, running through normal settlement processes, etc. Uh, it's also the the market is obviously very complex, and so it's uh, tricky to identify all of the consequences um, that are uh, that arise from the the UTS. Uh, itself. So just in terms of the direction of travel, in December we found that there was a UTS. Um, the outcomes associated with that were uh, essentially twofold. So there was um, uh, excess spill that occurred and there were also price and settlement outcomes that were um, essentially inconsistent with the underlying fundamentals or the, the supply and demand conditions during that period. And so we're consulting on these actions to, to correct, um, but we, um, in our view and uh, underpinning the consultation paper is the, 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 the view that we can't really res fully resolve the um, excess spill consequences, uh, and uh, so we can't unspill spill, um, to put that very simply. Uh, and so the consultation paper focuses um, on the price and settlement outcomes um, that ar arose. So I think b before we sort of really get into the, um, the details associated with the, um, the actions to correct, it's, it's worth um, just noting the relative importance of these um, um, different markets. So the spot energy market was roughly four and a half um, billion in 2020. Uh, loss and constraint excess, 140 million. Uh, instantaneous reserves, around 30 million. And frequency keeping, 15. So relative to the, the spot market, um, reserves and frequency keeping are, are roughly 1% of the size. So um, as we run through our actions to correct, it's, um, it's kind of the, 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 the most value, or at least in dollar terms, uh, is, is very much on uh, correcting the um, spot energy market. So if we get that right, then, then we'll be, uh, I think, most of the way there. So you can think of this um, sort of settlement process as roughly being in three steps. Um, so uh, if we want to revise um, settlement to try and uh, achieve um, better uh, confidence in the outcomes of the wholesale market, then we could um, revise offers, we could revise prices directly, or we could revise um, settlements. So I've um, denoted those uh, O for offers, P for prices, for final prices, nodal prices, and S for um, settlement. In principle, we could also revise um, re reserve offers. Um, the main proposal is not to actually do that. So, but there is a, a question about whether that's the appropriate thing to do or not. So those um, offers get fed through into um, scheduling, pricing, and dispatch. Um, uh, and the re reserve offers uh, and uh, the, the spot offers are, are combined. And um, together with load, the um, cost of electricity is uh, 
um, minimized. So the, there's a co-optimization step at, at that point. Um, these prices are then combined with actual dispatch and um, actual load to determine um, settlement. So what we're proposing is to, to uh, revise uh, offers and, um, and to essentially use normal market processes to flow through into those next steps, into revising prices and re revising settlement. Now, I don't know the extent to which um, everyone who's uh, listening to this is kind of familiar with um, offers, so I just thought I'd note that for uh, an individual trader, at a given t time period, they can make up to five offers. The offers um, are ordered by prices, so you can make up to five uh, offers in the spot energy market. Um, so the the, um, the band one prices are the, the lowest, and the band prime five prices are the highest. But you don't necessarily make uh, need to make offers at um, all of those prices. You could just make off offers at, at one price. So this is a reasonably um, complex problem. Um, my wife is a graphic designer, so she's currently ashamed at me because of that picture. Uh, it's a three-dimensional array of uh, offer prices. So, so there's 25 days uh, during the UTS period. There's 48 uh, trading periods in a day. So you're talking about 1,200 um, uh, trading periods uh, th in this UTS period. There are there are G um, uh, generators, say, and um, and then each each uh, generator can make up to um, five offers. So you could think of those if if that was a, a loaf of bread, which it's it's not. You could think of each slice of bread corresponding to a, a different um, a different band, and uh, where generators haven't actually. Um, uh, specified a price, then you could think of those as being NAs or you know, missing numbers. So um, this is this is a, a large number of um, offer prices, uh, and so we've been uh, um, essentially trying to come up with a, um, a relatively straightforward way to, uh, to um, deal with a, a complex problem and um, again just to, to uh, highlight what um, uh, people will already be familiar with from the, uh, the consultation paper itself. What we're proposing is to put a cap on offers. So you could think of uh, cap on offer, offer prices. So you could think of this multi-dimensional array and going into the array and essentially um, uh, decreasing every offer price that's above uh, a, a given level down to to that um, that offer price cap, while all prices that are below the off, offer um, cap level would would still be retained. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there's um, these these prices also correspond to. Uh, a bunch of quantities, so you could think of there being another um, loaf of bread that's associated with those quantities. So on, on the quantity front, um, the high standards of trading conduct provisions essentially incentivize uh, generators to offer um, all of the, the generation that they can. And so if they want to withhold generation, they essentially do that by, um, by uh, offering generation at, at high prices that they don't expect to, to to clear, so the, those those quantity quantities um, offer quantities essentially um, reflect the the operational constraints that um, generators already um, already face. <coughs> so in this in this process, one of the um, kind of key choices that we have is to um, determine whether we want to finalize prices or not. Essentially, this is this um, process is really um, uh, ultimately geared to <coughs> determining um, uh, set settlement outcomes. Um, and but if we are changing offers or or even changing final or changing prices directly, nodal <coughs> prices directly, we could um, um, choose whether to finalize those prices or not. And um, that has uh, implications because um, there are derivative markets off to the side, um, which are essentially tied to the underlying prices of the, the spot market. And so the, the choice to finalize prices 
um, then opens a channel through to um, uh, derivatives markets. So that's kind of one of the, uh, the key um, design choices. So, so I guess as I've already alluded to, there's um, a, a bunch of different choices that we have to make in, in, um, in determining the actions to correct. So one of the key um, issues is whose offers to re revise. So uh, the um, consultation paper makes clear that uh, what we're proposing is to revise um, the offers from the Lower South Island uh, hydro generators, um, excluding Manapuri and, and Tikapo A and B. Uh, we're proposing to put a, a cap on their offers and we're proposing to uh, a cap of $13.70 um, per megawatt hour reflecting um, an uh, analysis or based on analysis in, in the uh, preliminary and final decision papers. Um, as I've discussed, we're proposing to leave the offer quantities um, essentially unchanged. Uh, and But uh, ar arising from this revision process, there, there, are, uh, um, there will be constrained on, um, or there would have been constrained on payments originally, and by revising prices, we're essentially having implica implications for constrained on payments um, as well. Um, ancillary markets are affected because of the co-optimization of uh, instantaneous reserves um, with uh, spot energy. Um, we're, uh, we're not proposing to revise those offers, um, but there's a consultation qu question about that. And um, as I mentioned, we're proposing to uh, revised final prices which would then f flow through um, to derivatives markets, so both over-the-counter uh, markets, mm -hmm. uh, potentially ASX futures, although that's um, the outcomes there are likely to be determined by the ASX in conjunction with their regulator. Uh, FTRs, we expect them to be resettled, um, which is uh, reflecting implicit conditions in the FTR allocation plan and the, the participation agreements in those uh, in the FTR market and hedge settlement agreements um, that are lodged with the, the uh, clearing man manager are also um, expected to be revised given the way that the code is written. So I'm going to um, step through the first two um, bullet points um, and talk about them, and then I'll, um, I, I won't say anything further about the aggregate offer quantities given the, the remarks I've already made. Uh, and then I'll um, come back to constrained on payments when I start to talk about the um, market outcomes and then f finish off with um, ancillary markets and, and derivatives. So um, this is one of the uh, truncated symbols. So actually, this is probably a good point to pause and just see if there are any questions at this point. Mm, no, no, question, no questions online. Very good. Uh, so the, the first question was really about which generators to, um, to revise, uh, and, and this is a design choice. I'm going to sort of um, come at this by looking at the, the uh, exceptions. So we've, the original claim was made in conjunction, uh, um, in, with respect to um, um, the behavior of contact and uh, Meridian, um, and uh, uh, es essentially, we're proposing to revise the, the offers of the generating stations on the Waitaki and the uh, Klutha uh, Mata'o uh, rivers. We're not proposing to revise uh, Manipuri, uh, Manipuri's offers. So, um, so this particular picture illustrates um, th uh, a time series of um, uh, offer prices and offer quantities. And so you can see that um, essentially, throughout this uh, UTS period, the offer prices were um, uh, very low. So the, the purple on this particular um, picture is uh, the, the band one <laughs> offers. They're very close to zero. Band two and green. And there's uh, a small number of trading periods that have um, 
Band 5 offers at uh, a much higher price. Um, it won't be possible, I think, for people to see the scale, but that's roughly 1,500. Um, so that those low offer prices um, aren't going to be important for the marginal determination of um, uh, generation, and so therefore for the determination of um, um, prices. So there were, there were only um, 108 trading periods where Manipuri had uh, uh, any um, megawatts offered at greater than uh, $10 in the UTS period. The, the, the situation for Tekapo A and B is, is fairly similar. So again, they're, they're largely providing um, offers at very low prices. Um, there were some offers at uh, Tekapo A towards the end of the period where, um, where they were making offers at, at um, quite high prices. Those reflected uh, some operational um, uh, issues or um, that, that they had that, that meant that they um, couldn't continuously offer um, at, at a high price and so they were essentially um, motivated by um, those considerations. And Tekapo B is um, similar. I guess the other thing to note is that in the latter part of the UTS period, um, prices were very low, and and so um, uh, there's not much action in the, the latter half of the, the, the sample period. So we're, we're not um, proposing to correct offers from North Island uh, generators, so um, we largely consider that their efforts to conserve water were consistent with the impending outages, um, so that their, their behaviour was consistent with um, essentially the normal operation of the market and with with um, a, and was uh, expected in, in the light of the circumstance they faced. That the, the uh, original claim uh, wasn't in relation to North Island generators, which uh, again. Um, suggests that there weren't confidence concerns about what was going on in, in the North Island. And maybe a little bit selfishly from my point of view, I mean, this dramatically simplifies the correction. It would be um, uh, considerably more difficult to think about the appropriate um, corrections if we were to roll um, North Island generators into, into um, the actions to correct. So one of the other key choices that we're um, making is associated with the, um, the choice of the offer cap. <coughs> now, electricity is a desired good, so we know that generally it's going to have a positive um, price. So we know that the price is going to be zero or greater. Um, uh, the claimants suggested that, um, that the price should be close to a, a short-run marginal cost. Um, the estimate that we have in the consultation paper for short-run marginal cost for South Island generators is around $7.42, so that reflects the South Island um, mean uh, injection charge um, that they face, and then there's a small allowance for um, operating and um, maintenance costs. So that, that really provides kind of a lower bound. Um, the, the proposal that we have um, is, again, based on the analysis in the preliminary final decision paper, where we're essentially trying to identify a price that is going to absorb the, um, the excess spill that, that uh, could have been deployed to generate um, electricity. So that's a, a price of 1370 um, and we're currently of the view that that um, sort of provides an appropriate calibration to reflect both the hydrological circumstances of the, um, the period and competition at the, um, and a, and a uh, sort of usual or appropriate normal um, degree of comp competitive pressure. <coughs> um, now, that was, um, 
the excess spill at Benmore was a relatively conservative um, view of excess spill in in that um, in the, the market at that period of time. <coughs> Excuse me. So you could argue that uh, actually the price should be a, a little bit lower. Um, we noted in the final decision paper that there is no obligation to actually um, offer generation at, at uh, short run marginal cost, which was also noted by, uh, by submitters on the um, original uh, paper. Um, but we do expect competitive pressures to um, force prices towards the, um, uh, in this uh, lower direction, particularly in circumstances where there's an abundance of fuel that's resulting, um, uh, making it possible to generate um, prices essentially at, at lower cost. Now, this, this uh, particular price calibration, we don't think that there's a, um, a sort of a, a preeminent or uh, inherently superior methodology. So we're essentially exercising um, judgment in this. And so th again, this is uh, kind of a crucial uh, question in terms of calibrating the, the actions to correct. Um, we'd note that uh, we have considered um, other alternatives, so for example, the lower South Island price, the fifth percentile of that um, is uh, 1830. Um, we considered trying to calibrate uh, corrections based on h uh, historical data um, uh, when hydrological conditions were, were essentially similar. That resulted in uh, a lower South Island price of around $29.59. Um, um, but the, the, the difficulty with doing that is that the hydrological circumstances were um, particularly extreme in 2019. So the, the um, periods where the circumstances were most similar were in 1995 and 1958. And so neither of those is is, is uh, useful for really trying to, um, to calibrate the circumstance. All right. Well, um, and again, maybe here's another opportunity to pause for questions. <coughs> Paul. Did you consider looking at water value calculations to determine the uh, spill price? It's looking at you know, water value is always a statistical sort of model of forwards, and that's based on uh, uncertainty and looking at uh, level of reserves, you know, average storage, um, probability of spill versus probability of an outage. So if you work on a, a higher spill price, that means that you're prepared to run your storage higher for longer. If you are going to a zero value, if you're going to go down to an SRMC, then you tend to keep your storage lower over time to maximise the, the revenues that are available from your water. Um, that's the sort of trade-off that's, uh, that's appropriate. Um, but, uh, yeah, have you looked at that sort of model? So the question was, for those online, in case we didn't hear the start, have we thought about using water value uh, calculations to calibrate the office here? Christy? So, so for the, the actions to correct um, directly, uh, the, the short answer is no. But I guess, Doug, did you want to comment on that? Um, I'd, I'd say that's a special case of using cost, right? And we haven't done that. Um, but uh, I guess the SRMC is an estimate of that. Okay, we have a question from Rob online. Thanks, James. Um, you, made, you made the point very clearly you know, that you can't undo what's been done. A company can't be put back together again. You can't unspill um, water that's been spilled. Um, um, so that limits the extent to which you can fully remedy the situation. Um, but there are matters that are in your control that you mean that you could remedy it more fully than you have done. For example, 
you have made a decision or a draft decision to use a conservative estimate 1370. Um, have you considered doing a, um, a best estimate of what the prices should have, the office should have been during the UTS given the circumstances where there were large inflows and competition should have been stronger than normal? Okay, I think the question was probably clear for everyone. Christy, you happy to answer that? Yeah, so, so I think um, <coughs> you're, you're right that the, the original 1370 estimate was conservative because it's based on, um, uh, on uh, excess spill only at, at Benmore and so arguably um, on that basis um, you, know, you, you could uh, suggest that a, a lower um, cap might be appropriate. We'll see um, implicitly that the, the 1370 that um, cap is a little bit different to the, the, the well the outcomes from that are a little bit different to um, the original FTP paper because that that paper was based on uh, on a single offer um, price and um, so maybe a little bit perversely that means that um, low prices are actually, um, well, low offers are actually raised to, to the, the cap. Um, that means for what we've proposed, actually, you get more generation. So there's, there's um, the, the FTP noted that there was, and we'll see this in a moment, that there was uh, 47 <coughs> megawatts of, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, excess spill that, that uh, could be cleared, um, whereas with with the 1370 offer cap, we're actually um, uh, getting an increase in um, transfer over the HVDC link of um, six, 60 megawatts. So, you, um, so arguably, that using a, a 1370 number has already <coughs> veered towards um, to uh, towards a price that um, uh, clears more excess spill. And the, the, the difficulty then is to determine whether that was um, really feasible given that the operational um, and hydrological circumstances that, that prevailed and um, ultimately that's uh, I think t difficult to determine and if you wanted to press me more on that I would again de defer to Doug. trying to minimise my spill in real time, so not having the advantage of retrospectively coming up with the 1370. What kind of pricing offer would I need to do to ensure I didn't unnecessarily spill water? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think that's yeah, a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I've got a. <coughs> I'm not sure that any of us have an answer to that specific um, question yeah, at this point. I mean, it, it goes to the heart of the issue that water was um, unnecessarily spilt, raising prices. So, what I'm trying to get at is, well, what would contact and reading have to have done to avoid an unnecessary spill? I think it's quite a bullseye um, question for the GS. There you go. So I think, um, is that you, Rob? You, Rob. Yep. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, the thing that we've been doing all through this is estimate, estimating excess spill just at Benmore because that's what we could measure. Okay. So we can't measure excess spill at all stations um, throughout this period. Um, so that's why we call it an estimate. So to answer your question, we need to um, estimate all, all that excess spill at all those. Um, stations in the South Island, so we need some sort of model that we don't have, which is a model that combines hydrology and, and the market um, for both contact and meridian stations in the South Island. So we haven't been able to do that, and that's, I think, we've been made that clear um, in the um, preliminary and final decision papers. So 
I, I realise it's a good question, but it's uh, not just not answerable. You know, <clears throat> maybe just a follow up. I mean, um, in relation to the, the contact question, I mean, um, <clears throat> they're essentially having to to kind of deal with two problems. One is, um, you know, you, you could you could um, offer low, and obviously there is uh, a low enough price where we wouldn't have any competition concerns. But um, at the same time, they're tr uh, essentially trying to offer in a way that meets those operational constraints. And um, so, uh, again, it's going to depend on the, the particular circumstances about whether um, you know high offers uh, are justified by the circumstances that, that they face. Um, a slightly easier, I think, question. Uh, Corey, you said that there are 108 trading periods where Manapori was offered at a high price. Um, so I was, wasn't clear why that um, didn't lead you to say that we'll include Manapori in the um, offer cap. So I said that it was higher than $10, which is still not necessarily a high price. Um, but uh, again, this is ultimately, you know, one of the consultation questions is about who we should fold into this. Um, it's been noted in the media that, that by um, uh, not including Manipuri in that, um, in the correction, that, that, that then makes them eligible for, eligible for constrained on payments uh, of, if memory serves me correctly, about $70,000. Again, relative to the size of the market as a whole, it's kind of um, uh, small p potatoes. I mean, it's not s small f for me as a proportion of my salary, but for the market it is. Um, so uh, this is one of the things that we um, want feedback on. And, and uh, so if people have st strong views or, um, or uh, foundedly strong views, then, then uh, please submit and uh, inf inform the, the ultimate decision that we make. Do you know how many trading periods Manapuri was over 1370? Sorry, I didn't quite. Do we know how many trading periods Manapuri was over 1370? Uh, we could find that out, but I uh, don't, know, don't know it off the yes, top of my head. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Rob. Any other further questions online? Oh, Sam Fleming. Hey, uh, just wondering, given the shift from a total price reset at 1370 in the decision paper to now a, an offer cap at 1370, um, whether the authority's actually done the calculations to determine what offer price cap would in fact dispatch the avoidable hydro spill, rather than in excess of that, which is now the case? So um, we'll see, maybe I can come back to that question in a couple of slides because yeah, sure. um, there is, a, um, I think, a, a reasonably clear answer. Um, because we've done, <coughs> excuse me, multiple calibrations of the, uh, the offer price cap, we have s some idea of, um, of, of that. Um, so maybe I'll just move on at this point. So again, the... Um, uh, I'd like to re reiterate that much of the action is in the, the spot energy market. So um, we see that um, by correcting South Island offers, we're getting impacts both through um, through the South Island and through the, the North Island. So these are average um, spot uh, prices um, computed as, as the, the value divided by uh, the number of um, megawatt hours in those islands. So that there, um, and, and we've got the UTS on the, the far right as I look at it, um, and the $13.70 um, offer cap uh, is resulting in um, prices in the North Island of just under $41 on average and, and um, 23 and a half or thereabouts in the South Island. If we look at um, 
and I've just done simple averages of the uh, sur and fur um, prices, so instantaneous reserve prices. Generally, um, those prices to decline as part of the um, the uh, the correction. Um, the, the more the more we um, reduce the the offer cap level, uh, offer price cap, um, the the lower those um, prices generally fall. So uh, again, maybe because I'm an economist, I'm going to spend a lot of time on on prices. So. So again, you could think of this as there being some distribution of prices um, and the correction ends up in the lower ta tail of those prices, which is um, what you expect given the hydrological circumstance. And so I've drawn in two lines on that, that chart to, to roughly illustrate um, uh, those North Island and South Island um, prices. You see that there are observations that are below, but it is uh, in the, the lower tail of the, the distribution. And if we look at those, uh, the North Island prices through time and compare, compare the corrected prices or revised prices under the um, $13.70 proposal uh, against the UTS, the, the action is largely in the f first half of the, the period or um, up until so the, uh, the 18th of um, December, um, and we see a, a, s a similar um, and somewhat more stark um, uh, downward, downward revision in, in prices um, in the South Island as, as expected. Now, um, we've mentioned that that there's a calibration choice associated with the offer price cap and if I just oscillate between these two slides you can see that a 742 which is you know approximately the SRMC price um, still has some of those um, spikes in prices um, through time uh, reflecting the fact that um, South Island generators are not kind of the, the sole determinant of um, market prices um, but the but the, the essentially the waterline of the floor um, is is bumped lower, and um, and th that impacts um, prices f right throughout the the UTS period, including the latter um, part of the sample where prices are already uh, relatively low. So this illustrates the price separation between the north and or bit between Haywards and uh, Benmore uh, under the correction and with the original UTS prices so you, you can see um, I've been a little bit lazy so I've just wanted to highlight that these are slightly different scales so the scale of the right hand graph is up to two hundred dollars and the scale on the, um, the UTS graph is uh, only up to 150 so you're getting more periods of um, price separation, um, again, pre predominantly in the, um, the, f the first part of the sample. So th those were prices uh, in terms of the total impact, and I ha have to uh, apologize, I realized um, in putting these slides together that I made a, a slight error, so there's uh, of essentially double counted reserve costs in those totals, but it doesn't affect the outcomes very, very much. Basically, the um, relative to the UTS period, um, uh, the the cost of electricity, um, and if if you focused on just the North Island and and South Island spot electricity costs, you'd get a pretty similar total. Um, it reduces electricity costs costs around um, 80 million dollars or 78, 79 million dollars uh, depending on exactly how you want to um, calculate it. Now the um, the proposal does result in higher constraints uh, on costs relative to the original UTS period for reasons that will become evident in the next slide. So we can think of um, there being uh, 
uh, high offer price um, relative to, say, the original final price, and, and a, a generator might still have been dis dispatched for system sec security concerns, and then they would have um, received this amount of constraint on. Now, we're because we're um, typically w w prices are, re um, are being revised lower, reflecting the um, the downward pressure on on South Island hydro generators offers. Now that generator um, would be eligible for um, a much larger amount of constraint on. And obviously generators that were, were um, offering in at this level, originally they wouldn't have been eligible for constraint on because they had um, uh, offer prices below the final price. But now with the revision to final prices, they too would become eligible for constraint on and it's not very elegant, but um, hopefully that uh, 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 indicates what I'm talking about. Whereas, in contrast, a, a generator that made a low offer initially, they would be um, receiving this final price, but under the revision associated with the actions to correct, they're now only um, receiving this amount. So they're still receiving more than they offered, but um, just not, not as much, and consequently, they are um, having to uh, pay back money associated with the, um, the excess payment. Again, this is um, on, based on the assumption that the proposal actually um, proceeds. So this is this is the uh, the, the slide that I was talking about um, uh, a little bit before in relation to to Sam's question. So. Um, We've essentially conducted an exercise where we've considered different offer prices, where the offer price caps, where the offer price caps are motivated by slightly different um, uh, um, choices. We see that um, with the the offer price cap at thirteen seventy, which is the the kind of the starting point, that results in sixty megawatts of um, transfer from this um, over the HVDC link. So that that is um, greater than the excess um, spill at Benmore. If we were essentially trying to replicate um, that exactly, then it would be pretty close to this nineteen. Uh, oh, that's a terrible error. Nineteen dollar ninety eight uh, um, uh, offer price cap. My, uh, like I said, my wife is the graphic designer. I wish that she could see this just to, to see the look on her face. Um, anyway, uh, and and the reason that we uh, uh, considered nineteen dollars ninety eight was essentially just so that we would have kind of um, uh, two prices that were symmetric around um, thirteen dollars seventy. So, so seven uh, the difference between thirteen dollars and seven forty two is the same as the difference between um, nineteen dollars ninety eight and, and uh, thirteen dollars um, seventy so um, so those are some you know alternatives that that um, could be considered um, and the reason that the the uh, the single offer price that's um, reported here is a little bit different to the, the $47 number is that um, that one that and $13.70 was a, an estimate based on interpolation and secondly um, this number is associated with just revising offers at the, um, the eight generating um, stations uh, and and doesn't include um, Manipuri and, and Tekapo A and B. So again to illustrate the, the, the time series we see that that um, and a, again in accord with the, the price um, pictures that we saw that we could get much more transfer through the earlier part of the, the um, period and not much through the, the latter part. Oh. Sorry. So uh, maybe just w one more kind of comment about the overall effects, and then uh, we'll pause again for, for questions. So, the the implications um, are essentially that generators have to 
refund overpayments that have been made to them arising from the lack of competition, from the distortion that arose from the, um, the, the UTS. Retailers and purchasers would receive refunds from overpayments uh, that they made initially. But uh, it's important to realise that hedges really moderate the implications of, um, of this for individual participants. And um, so, so again, you know, the, the market as a whole, it's a kind of, um, well, for economists, it's important, important to understand it's a zero-sum game, right? So we're, if we're moving money from some participants, then other participants are um, receiving money. And so um, just kind of in the table presented a, a toy example to illustrate that the, um, that the and, and this is essentially to illustrate, say, the, the, the spot market impact, that the impact depends on the, the hedging that um, entities have. So for uh, a, a, a generator retailer that generates a lot more than they retail, then they're um, likely to have to pay back money. A hedged generator, if they're perfectly hedged, then, then the implications would be zero in, in net terms for, for such a participant. An independent generator, they're likely to have to pay pay back money, um, and uh, um, an independent retailer or purchaser that wasn't uh, hedged otherwise would would benefit from these um, uh, from from the, the refunds. Now, the in the authorities' estimates have indicated that um, the change in the loss and constraint. Uh, excess or the residual um, thereof would would be positive. So you can think of them as being um, essentially a, an extra participant, but they, they could be, um, depending on, on how prices go, um, you know, this could have been a, a, a minus five and um, sort of under the generation column instead of uh, under um, the receiving money column. So the important thing to understand is that the, the gross amounts at the, the bottom of the uh, table um, are equal uh, and the, the net amount, net impact for participants ultimately should sum to zero and, and to the extent that they don't, that indicates that there's uh, um, either a missing participant or a miscalculation. So let me pause again here and see if there are any other questions. Dean, should we get the microphone over? Uh, just a question about the 1370. Is that a sort of a static calculation? Because I wonder if there are some trading periods where 1370 would be too high to clear all, um, to clear all excess spill at Benmore. Or too low, perhaps? Or is it sort of an average figure across all trading periods? Yeah, I mean, we we considered whether it was feasible to um, essentially optimize these these prices um, um, more, um, but the the short answer is they are they are just uh, um, an average, and so it's 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 not. Um, um, yeah, we're not optimizing period by period. I mean, and, and one of the reasons for, or, or one difficulty about trying to do that, um, even as, uh, if, if you're just trying to resolve excess will at um, Benmore, is that that um, the they're trying to uh, essentially meet a NIWA standard for the measurement of, of flows through through the, 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 the dam and. Um, you know the the central limit theorem says that an average of those is going to have a smaller standard error, right? So there's a, they're, they're trying to have a 95% confidence interval that is within 8% of the, the true value, for example. So there's there's kind of uncertainty um, about what that should exactly be uh, in the first place. So yeah, it's it's one aspect of this being an approximate. Um, solution to correct the uh, the problem. 
Is there anything online? No. No other questions. No, Sam. Sorry. Just wondering, with the the volumes of spill avoided under the 1370 offer cap, if the authority's done any work to confirm that that's in fact hydrologically feasible while still meeting resource consents and operational constraints? Yeah. So I think that, that that's. Uh, that's a, a, a determining the operational feasibility of that. That is um, difficult slash impossible. Is there anything no. else you'd want to add to that? The similar answer to Rob's question previously, right? So we don't have that sort of modern capability to do that. Um, so ultimately, it's a judgment call um, about what's what's appropriate in that space. You know, Christine. Uh, you might come to this later, but how have you assessed the impact on, of the delay in the price reset and settlement on both those that are owed money and those that um, have to pay money? Sorry, the, the delay? Well, the, the date when we finally get the wash up. So there, there is a, a consultation question about, um, about what, what interest rate should ultimately be uh, applied to those um, payments uh, given the that essentially, the, um, you know, generators have had access to funds um, in, in advance of when they're having to pay back. Um, and so, you know, again, if, if you've got any sp specific views about what the appropriate interest rate is, obviously wholesale rates are very low at the moment. Um, I wasn't talking about interest rates, but more impact of uncertainty. So, Sorry, maybe you should <laughs> keep the mic for a moment. Um, uh, so you're you're concerned about the the uncertainty impact of the delay in the decision and how that might be J just the length of time it's taken from yep. when the, the event happened and um, the remedy. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, I don't know if James has <laughs> anything that he wants to comment on that. I think. Um, that's uh, an undesirable feature of this process, but unfortunately it, it has been um, c complex for the authority to work through and the consultation process that we've undergone has uh, inherently um, resulted in a delay and I, I don't see that there's, there's, uh, that there's um, kind of particular actions that we can take to, um, to uh, change that out outcome at, at this point in time. Yep, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, I think in the latter half of December, the flood was successfully managed at you know reasonably low prices, so we've got really no reason to suspect that um, it couldn't have been managed through all December at, us, at those sort of low prices. Questions online? No. Hmm? Just the key oh. difference there, is demand. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah and that, that's fundamentally a difficult um, challenge for this is uh, trying to determine exactly what, what should have um, occurred given that there are sort of two sides to this equation. So let's let's turn to ancillary markets. So again, I want to emphasize that um, most of the action is in the, the spot energy market. Um, uh, and for um, thinking about trans transfer of the HVDC link, um, reserve offers in the North Island are probably more important than um, reserve offers in the, the South Island. Um, we considered uh, steps that could be taken to to um, to revise instantaneous reserve offers in tandem with spot energy offers, um, but this is, I guess, our initial take on this is it, it it's in the pretty hard basket as well, um, although not 
not necessarily um, impossible. For the most part, uh, reserve offers in the South Island are, are very low through this period, so this table illustrates the, um, the maximums. The exception to that observation is really um, contacts uh, offer behaviour at um, Roxburgh and, and Clyde. So they, they did have um, a certain, or um, quite a number of, uh, of um, offers that were at, at high prices for reserves because they, they didn't want to be um, dispatching anything, including reserves. And so they're, again, essentially pricing themselves out of the market. And so the consultation paper does provide a few suggestions about um, ways that they could be revised if, if people um, uh, or submitters consider that, that it's really important to do so. So again, this is another aspect where we're looking for um, feedback. Uh, we note that there is uh, um, the possibility of constraint on associated with um, re reserves as well. And uh, again, the eligibility for that would be um, tr treated symmetrically um, uh, um, to that of the, the spot energy market. So, so if we have um, revised offers, then you wouldn't be eligible for um, constrained on. Uh, the, uh, and just turning to derivatives markets, so this, this, uh, this is a very inelegant um, picture. So again, apologies for that. But the, the point is essentially that open interest in derivatives markets um, changes through time. Uh, um, and so the, typically, if we're far, far enough away from the, the time period of interest, then there's, um, the open interest is essentially um, very low. It starts to ramp up the, the closer that we get. And then towards the end of the period, it tends to um, reduce as, as uh, people close out their positions. So the, the resettlement that is likely to occur in, um, or m that may occur in um, derivatives markets is really simply um, associated with the end of period holdings. So it's um, at least in, in I guess our current view it's not pr practical um, to try and go back in um, time and, and um, resolve what um, a, a different parties would have um, been prepared to pay uh, or the, the choices that they might have liked to have made um, through time in terms of their derivatives holdings. So, so that our, um, again, this is a, an aspect um, where the proposed action to correct the UTS is, is an approximation. And again, that's a, a little bit different to the spot energy market where, where essentially we're just... Um, um, or individuals are making choices at, at a single point in time, and so corrections are a little bit easier. The <coughs> FDR market, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, expected to resettle given the way um, uh, um, the participation and allocation agreements are, are written. Um, again, assuming that the proposal goes through. So generally, what we see in terms of prices, and I've only um, provided the, the um, options um, re results uh, here, the OPT um, FTRs, uh, just because they're more, more commonly traded, the, the, um, the paper has both OPT and OBL, so the obligation um, uh, FTRs. Um, the basic insight is that you get more price separation, so um, there's a greater difference between prices after the correction between the islands, but within islands the, um, the price separation tends to de decline. Yep. And so again, there's likely to be uh, an increase in residual LCE to transpower um, and uh, there's scope to direct um, over and under payments of residual LCE to be um, corrected as, as required. 
So this is, this is uh, essentially my second to last slide. In some ways the table is not very interesting. So this is just, uh, a, again, we've made a preliminary um, uh, estimate of the resettlement based on open interest of, um, of futures and options um, traded on the ASX. If, if that market was to resettle um, uh, at the end of the period now, so, so there are only, obviously there are only two nodes, Benmore and Odahu, uh, with, with these kinds of um, contracts. The, um, and what we find again is that uh, as we um, reduce the, the offer price cap, the, um, the resettlement um, amounts uh, increase. So, so this is essentially the, ch the change in settlement. So this is the single offer price. This is uh, offer price cap of 1370 in the middle column and the offer price cap of 742 in, in the column on the far side. Um, I think the, the important thing to um, understand is that this is going to um, uh, affect not necessarily New Zealand participants, but also participants that, that or um, if it occurred, it would affect p participants that um, uh, are essentially providing liquidity in, in those markets. Um, and they may not be, they may be less familiar with the, um, the UTS provisions. Um, the ASX has um, indicated that that um, they are not sure that uh, a revision at this stage of the process would be consistent with their obligations as a um, uh, Australian um, well, market provider, um, and and so it may be that they they um, after consultation with their regulator they may choose not to revise prices. So it's important to understand that that's a, um, a possibility. And there is um, uh, essentially limited scope for the um, authority to, uh, well, there is no scope for us to direct the uh, ASX to um, reach a decision that's uh, inconsistent with their um, legislated obligations. So, so that's uh, something that is important to be mindful of. Um, so I have two quick slides. So basically, we found a UTS. We've proposed an action to correct the UTS um, based on calibrating the offers of South Island hydro generators, the eight generating stations on the Clutha and uh, Waitaki rivers. It's, um, our proposed action to correct is really an approximation. Uh, we can't perfectly um, undo the outcomes, uh, and so we're seeking public feedback and really welcome your submissions. And just to note that, um, again, we'll reiterate what James mentioned previously, the consultation closes on the 27th, and then there's a three-week uh, cross-submission period. Um, the final decision paper will be drafted by staff. Um, and a decision will be made. And then the operational and implementation, which um, again, if the proposal proceeds um, along the lines of the consultation paper, would involve both the pricing manager and the clearing manager, and that's likely to take um, several months uh, um, for them to uh, implement. So I'll finish there and Excellent. take any further questions. Thanks, Christy. Any further questions online? One from Rob. I think you're muted, Rob. You're able to unmute. We go. Sorry, um, just, a, just a point of clarification around paragraph 5.48, but also elsewhere in the consultation paper where it states the authority proposes that only generators that did not have their offers reset would be eligible for constrained on payments. 
Now, the way that I read that was um, contact and meridian were the generators that had their offers reset, and therefore they wouldn't be eligible for constraint on payments. But in the elsewhere in the consultation paper, it says Manapuri wouldn't get um, constraint on payment. Yeah, so just, just to be clearer on that point, what we're proposing is that if we revised prices at a particular generating station, they so would not be so eligible. So but so the statement's, okay, so the statement's missing a word. Sorry? Correct, it's generation stations rather than generation yeah. ent entities. So is there a particular reason, given that um, Brilliant and Contact um, are having their offers reset, that um, it would be suitable for the remedy to give them constraint on payments? So for, um, for example, for other, other stations elsewhere in the country, we're, we're proposing that they would be eligible, and that ref reflects the, the fact that, um, that it's important for um, there to be incentives for um, generating stations or generators in those circumstances to support system security and so that, that kind of reflects uh, I guess usual um, market practice there's uh, an alternative which is suggested um, could be implemented uh, in which they would be remunerated according to their cost uh, um, in, instead of um, their offers um, but that would be more complicated um, in terms of uh, correction. Um, but uh, again, um, you know, if you have strong views that are, that are well founded as to why that shouldn't occur, then please submit on that. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Any other questions online? Questions in the room? Last call. Oh, Rob's back. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, a question I asked um, on Monday by email, um, I was just wanting to understand between the preliminary decision and the final decision and this UTS remedy, you moved from a price of 652, I think it was on the top of my head, um, to 1370, and I was just wondering, you know, what explains that difference? Okay. Y yeah, I mean, oh, maybe Doug wants to answer it, but uh, I think the, sh the short version is it's primarily the the the, the change in the um, period. So the the 635 was associated with. Um, the whole whole of December and the, and the thirteen seventy is is uh, uh, um, what arises from the three to twenty seven December period. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any further any final questions. Thank you, Christy very much for that. Thank you very much everyone for coming. Um, please do submit. So always look forward to hearing people's views and again your views on other people's views are extremely useful as well. So um, look forward to that. Thanks very much.